Billy McNeil holds Celtic's European Cup. It was a pride of personal performance. It was a pride of team performance. And it was a pride in achieving something for the club. May 25th, 1967, and Celtic come out for the European Cup final. I'd never seen a better team, either before or since, in the Lisbon Lions. Man for man, with no better players. That team could not have been better. Now here's Craig, the man whose foul gave away the penalty. Gemmell's inside him. Here comes Gemmell, and it's a goal! Celtic are level after 62 minutes. That, that period of football, for British football, was terrific. You know, Celtic boys winning it uh, just the year before us, being the first British team to win it. Maybe in a little way, it took the pressure off us a little bit. You know, they'd won it, and uh, they, they'd won it in style. Celtic come forward again. It's Murdoch out to Gemmell. Gemmell attacking down the left, as usual. He's knocking back down. Once again, it's Murdoch, and it's Chalmers deflects it into the net. It's 2-1 for Celtic with five minutes to go. Surely they've won it now. To be the first is great, and Celtic were the first. And uh, it was a great set at that time. And here's Billy McNeil holding the cup for Celtic. Only the fifth club to win this trophy, and the first British club. 25 years on, we have uh, seen the impact that it made on the Celtic support because everywhere you go, people want to tell you where they were. Youngsters come up and say, listen, I remember watching it on the television with my dad and my grandfather and things, and people, people say, I was there. Now, that is, the, that is the big thing. People want to say, I was in Lisbon. And it's, uh, 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 it's, it's almost as if they're saying, I identify with this club because I was there. Victoria's Glasgow launches the 25th anniversary celebrations of the Lisbon Lions. Welcome, Ronnie Simpson. Jim Craig. Tommy Gamble. Bobby Marta. John Clark. Jimmy Johnston. Willie Wallace, Stevie Chalmers, Bertie Ald, Bobby Lennox, and gentlemen, a special welcome for the other members of the great Celtic squad, John Fallon, Willie O'Neill, Joe McBride. Charlie Gallagher. John Hughes. And the captain of the Lisbon Lions, Billy McNeil. The waistlines and hairlines may have changed, but 25 years ago, they were 11 young Scots, each of them born and raised within 30 miles of Glasgow. The Lisbon Lions challenged the biggest names in European football and won. This year, throughout Scotland, the men who accomplished the unique feat of winning every trophy open to them in a single season were reunited in a series of special events starting in Glasgow in the spring and continuing throughout the year. The year of their greatest triumph was 1967, when Celtic, led by Jock Steen, became the first British side to win the European Cup. 25 years later, the Lisbon Lions are still remembered as the most successful club side in the history of Scottish football. It's always been my ambition to emulate the, the Lisbon Lions. It's an achievement that every player wants and I'm delighted for all the lads here tonight that they've achieved it and I just hope that someday Celtic can do the same again. I've got to say that as much as they were, the, I think, sort of the best team that's been Scotland over the years and you say, well, MD ever be the same? I don't really think so because they were the first British team to win the European Cup. So MD can emulate that. But some of the things they got up to, 
they liked a bit of fun. But they always put it in perspective at the right time. On the night they actually won the cup, uh, watching the game uh, at home with my father. Um, I mean, the winning goal and he just picked me up and threw me up and smashed my head off the ceiling. <laughs> Our people today, tactic-wise, are smarter. I'm not saying Inter Milan were a bad, bad team. They said they seem to play with a little bit more freedom. Today, that freedom seems to have stopped. So I think that may have been the last you'll see in Scotland of a good footballing team. Other teams hopefully will win European competitions, but I don't think in the style that Celtic did it. They're a great bunch of characters as well as good players. And I think uh, they've all got a, everybody's got a soft spot for, for what they achieved in their day, you know. The whole of Ireland uh, are great supporters of Celtic, and uh, in the time when the Lisbon Lions, of course, won the European Cup, everybody was tuned into the television. Likewise, I was the same, and uh, I, uh, I remember that, that particular time of great memories, although I was only a young boy, and it probably was the first memory that I had, and uh, made, made me a Celtic supporter, made everybody else over in Ireland uh, thorough Celtic supporters. We were fortunate to play along with these guys, and probably their hardest game was against us, I feel. For the you know, players like Danny, Josh Connolly, and Louis Kerry and that. Uh, and there was a time, about that time, Big Jock tried to put it forward that Celtic would have a second team playing the whole second division. It didn't materialise because we'd probably end up winning it. <laughs> but it's true there, they were great players. Without having trained and played with them, I wouldn't have been the player I was. And I think we've always got to remember without Jock staying, many would have been what we were. Chuck was the type of manager who came with a tracksuit on, came out with us every day in the week, and worked with us. It was a complete new setup to us, and we enjoyed every minute of it. We really enjoyed it. Big Jock was something special. He just, I mean, he just wasn't a, a football manager. He was, he, he looked after you. I mean, there was a lot of times, not just myself. The other players, a lot of problems, maybe, maybe a wee, something maybe happening. He had to have you right for you going to that park. He would come to you, he would say to him, you'd take the problem to him, he would solve it. And he could tell, he'd say, you know, there's something up, and he would make a wee fuss, he'd take you to the side. I mean, it must have been a, a, a hell of a job, but he'd done it well. He didn't ask incredible demands of anybody, he just sort of steered things around his way of thinking, and. He got the, the, the right response from the players, a great group of players. That might have been a bit of luck, but uh, it all couldn't go down to luck. He could communicate, which is very, very important when you're handling uh, players. Uh, I think that's the most important aspect of the lot. He's a good psychologist, and which is important to get the best out of any individual. Uh, he knew when to hammer, and when to be soft, and... Um, all those things put together uh, makes up a good manager. Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome, please, Mrs. Jock Steen. From their base in Glasgow, the squad kick off the East of Scotland celebrations by taking the road and the miles to Dundee. I've been sitting here for 45 minutes. 
Everywhere they go, they still attract huge crowds. No one, including fans not yet born when Billy McNeil and his men added the name of Celtic to the most important prize in club football, can forget the Lisbon Lions. Bobby. That's an expensive boot, you I know you were at Rodrigo. I know. I didn't like he's about to lose about another four or five. Yeah, I thought you were going to do that. Donnie McKinnon. I says, Donnie, is this your room? He says, aye. He says, you'll not believe who's in it, boss. I says, how about Excuse me, officer. I says, what is it? He says, somebody peed my mum. Who was there? Grab back in the door. Daisy comes out with weary eyes. You know, what is it, boss? Let's go! We still get a wonderful reception, no matter where we go. A welcome guest at the Aberdeen celebrations was the former Manchester United and Northern Ireland star, the incomparable George Best. I think every night we've been together has been tremendous. I really, I've enjoyed every time I've been together. There's always somebody remembering something or somebody saying something. Do you remember the night or do you remember the day? Do you remember the goal? Do you remember the game? It's been absolutely really special. The year's events included a nostalgic return to West Kilbride Golf Course at Sea Mill, where the squad relaxed during their successful European campaign. It's not me, honest. it's somebody dressed up. <laughs> actually said the other day, so I don't know what's going to happen when all this is finished, this 25th year, because what are we going to do next year? We're not see each other for a few months. <laughs> and he was uh, thoroughly enjoying meeting up again. Yeah. The old crack. The city chambers in Glasgow. This was the splendid setting for a civic lunch given in honour of Celtic and the Lisbon Lions by Glasgow District Council. Celtic chairman Kevin Kelly, nephew of Sir Robert Kelly, who was chairman of the club during the year of their greatest triumph, was among the guests. We were 
the closest squad you could ever get was in the, in the time we played. But you know now we're more close. We're far, far closer now than ever, ever, ever before. We are a family. There's no fear or contradiction about it. And we'll never be other, any other than that because when you're in Glasgow, you're always recognising. I'm talking about people, my, my, my family, my son, my daughter will say to me, Dad, who is that? And really it is just people. It was also a year for remembering the club's roots. Celtic teams are always made welcome across the sea in Ireland, and none better than the European squad, the greatest in the club's long history. Ireland obviously is always special. If if you've played with Celtic, then even for a Scotsman like me, uh, you, you 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 learn to appreciate just the impact that the Irish have made in the club. It was their club; they started the club, and they were very very clever. They, they called it Celtic, which became obviously Celtic. But the influence uh, from the Irish has been dramatic, and the the functions. There's been one or two functions, but the big one in Dublin was, was tremendous. Great. It really was. It was a, an uncanny feeling being in that site. They were super, you know, they were just super confident. We, uh, we never, expected to lose a match uh, and we didn't lose many if I think we lo lost a couple of games that year but it was just a, a near about the place and, and the confidence was always there that we were capable of beating anybody. After we won the league in 66 the gaffer took the 1820s to America for almost six weeks and everybody got to know each other and we played loads of games and the camaraderie was great and I'm still convinced this day that was the big thing to made the team a team it was. Ronnie Simpson, for instance, with his experience and everything, we used to call him Dad and Pop and all that. But really, he was a, he was a, he was one that could turn around and say to us, "We've got it all to do. The start of anything, we've got it all to do." Now that was only one, and then you could go to wee Jimmy, and Jimmy was always he was looking at himself in the mirror and actually geeing himself up before the game, and very 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 few people would speak to him. But we knew we knew as an individual what type of person he was. The other one was Billy, he would strut about with his chest up and spitting him. That was his favourite, you know, and so confident of himself. You know, these were the type of people, Tommy Gemmel, very seldom seen him to about 20 minutes to the, before the game. We played around about 75 to 80 matches every season. It was great for the players because uh, when you're playing matches, it cut down on the uh, training activity. So you're, you're talking about playing Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. So in between times, all you did was uh, some sharp work and, and ball work. Mm -hmm. All the uh, all the heavy stuff was done pre-season, and the stamina was built up then. We had the bibs versus the non-bibs, and we had the same teams all year. And that was a much more important game than the Saturday game. Because <laughs> it was two parts of a dressing room against the other half, and, and it really was important. And do you know something? This is the marvellous thing about that. When I look back on it, you had John Hughes in the bench, Charlie Gallagher, uh, Joe McBride, you know, Willie O'Neill. They were all great players that could have walked into any team. But the thing about it, each and every one of them only wanted to do one thing, and that was play for Celtic. There was a pool of players. It wasn't just 11 boys that, that won the European Cup. There were 16 players, and they used them uh, very well indeed. And 
I know there was one uh, one game in particular we were playing, and uh, one of our players was trying to take the Mickey out of the opposition, and uh, he wasn't playing the next next game, and he knew the reason why. He told him in no uncertain manner because he, he felt that it wasn't very professional. Sixteen men, five cups won: the Glasgow Cup, the League Cup, the Scottish Cup, the League Championship, and the European Cup all in the space of 10 glorious months. To be a professional, I think the most important thing, you've got to be a winner. You've got to want to win. And often it was that ingredient and that determination that saw us through. Because skill alone and ability and organisation, they're smashing. But you've got to have that will to win. And that was a team that hated losing. They, they were bad losers, which I think is always important. Nine of that team were potential goal scorers. They went out John Kirk and the goalkeeper. Yeah. Billy scored, scored many great goals with his head. Both full backs could score. Bobby Martin and Bertie Hall, they scored goals. Uh, Wispy, that's Willie Wallace, Stevie Chambers, Bertie Hall, Jimmy Johnson. They all scored goals. So they were all potential goal scorers. So con consequently, it means that you've got an attack inside. And uh, that being so, uh, Inter Milan really didn't know what hit them. There was a terrible naivety when I look back that we didn't realise what we were letting ourselves in for in a sense. That each time we won and we went to a different stage of a European uh, process, quarter-final, semi-final, it was all new. We'd done something that any British side had never done before anyway. We'd got to the final and we said to ourselves, well fine, the weight's off our shoulders, let's go out there and enjoy it. Everything seemed to be right for us. The, the fans had been there and they'd, they'd laid out the groundwork. I even remember l big gardens just near the hotel that we were in and they had these big sort of uh, lights that were made out to be like toadstools, but they were painted green and white. Going into the sun was verboten, absolutely no way. Mm -hmm. All the press and the supporters were enjoying themselves in the sunshine in the pool. Uh, we, the only time we were out in the sunshine was when we were training. Uh, big jock at this idea that uh, sunshine weakened your muscles so there was no chances of getting out in the sun. <laughs> and then Big Jock did an incredible thing. He said to Neely, go and take the boys and I'll walk back home. And by this time of course it was dusk. Uh, Neely Mocking suddenly said, uh, there's the hotel over there. And we climbed down a ravine. And I remember claiming at least one fence in darkness to get back into the grounds of the hotel the night before a European Cup that <laughs> final. Goalkeeper Ronnie Simpson joined Celtic in 1964 from Hibernian. He won two FA Cups with Newcastle United, four league championships with Celtic, one Scottish Cup medal, three Scottish League Cup medals, and capped five times for Scotland. I was getting on for sure. One or two hours, who wouldn't admit to it, I suppose. But, so they'd been round the track before and they knew what was all about Bertie and people like that. Mm -hmm. Good professionals, mm -hmm. hardened professionals. That was important. And I don't think, uh, I think we surprised, we surprised them tremendously, that's for sure. Right back, Jim Craig joined 1963 from Glasgow University. Six league championship medals, four Scottish Cup medals, three League Cup medals and cap once for Scotland. Players realise how lucky they are to have a support like that behind them at all times. And it's come back out again this year um, to support fellas that, you know, played 25 years ago. Uh, and, of course, the great thing nowadays is that they forget all the bad moments. <laughs> <laughs> Left-back Tommy Gemmell joined 1961 from Colt Nash United. He won six league championship medals, three Scottish Cup medals, four League Cup medals, and capped 18 times for Scotland. I don't think we realised the enormity of what we'd done. I think basically 25 years on, we're now we're totally realising what it was all about and what it meant to everybody. 
Right half Bobby Murdoch joined 1961 from Canvas Lang Rangers. He won eight league championship medals, four Scottish Cup medals, five League Cup medals, and capped 12 times for Scotland. All the, the memories come flooding back. Now, you know, as I say, that uh, everybody connected with that season. It was, it was unbelievable. And everybody were great friends. Tremendous. Centre half and captain Billy McNeil joined in 1957 from Blantyre, Victoria. He won nine league championship medals, seven Scottish Cup medals. seven League Cup medals and was capped 29 times for Scotland. But that season, I think, changed everything quite dramatically because not only did it put us into the forefront of Scottish football, it put us right in amongst all the big boys in Europe as well. So that season was so important and uh, was so delightful that I still think to, to a degree that Celtic are trading on that to this day. Left half John Clark joined in 1958 from Lark Hall Thistle. He won three league championship medals, three Scottish Cup medals, four league cup medals, and was capped four times for Scotland. It's Celtic, it was going through, you know, a year part of it. it was a, you were an ambition to play for Celtic and it came through for you in that way, and then all of a sudden you're playing for the top prize in Europe, you know. That in itself was a great honour to me, anyway. Outside right, Jimmy Johnston joined in 1961 from View Park FC. He won nine league championship medals, five Scottish Cup medals in 67, 69, 71, 72 and 74. Five league cup medals in 66, 67, 69, 70 and 75 and was capped 23 times for Scotland. We worked hard at our game, but OK, you could say we played hard as well, but we never ever let them do it. We never let the people do it, the fans who were important. Inside right, Willie Wallace joined in 1966 from Heart of Midlothian. He won five league championship medals, three Scottish Cup medals, two League Cup medals and was capped seven times for Scotland. It was a really fantastic six months for me because I had uh, gone through a couple of years with Hearts and we hadn't really achieved much in the last couple of years I was there. And within uh, the six months I had won every honour that was possible in Scotland except the League Cup, which I uh, went on to win the following September. Centre forward Steve Chalmers joined in 1959 from Ashfield Juniors. He won four league championship medals, three Scottish Cup medals, four league cup medals, and was capped five times for Scotland. I'm very proud, very proud and honoured to be part of it, and fortunate that uh, I was picked. Inside left, Bertie Ald first joined the club in 1955 from Maria Hill Harp. He rejoined in 1965 from Birmingham City. He won four league championship medals, three Scottish Cup medals, four league cup medals, and was capped three times for Scotland. A wee bit lump came to my throat and, I, and the tears came into my eyes to think how, how great it was to play for that crowd and how to, to play in that team. It was magnificent. Outside left, Bobby Lennox joined in 1962 from Ardea. He won nine league championship medals between 1966 and 74. Eight Scottish Cup medals, a record in an amazing 15 year period between 1965 and 1980. Four Scottish League Cup medals and was capped ten times for Scotland. Well, I used to look around about the players in the dressing room at times and see wee Jimmy and Boy Murdoch, Billy McNeil, Bertie, Big Time, all the guys and think, 
We have a good team here. And, and there was nobody I thought could beat us. Inter Milan on the left, Celtic, Jockstein, Celtic on the right. The start of the European Cup final. They were very confident. Top side world. They obviously must have said to themselves, well, we're playing a sick team from Scotland. Uh, Scottish sides have never done particularly well in Europe. So we don't have anything to fear from them. It was a long walk from the, the dressing rooms to the, the actual small tunnel before we went up onto the, the pitch itself. And uh, we're all lined up, and here's the Italians, all smooth and swarthy with the, the baby oil in the face and the legs. Uh, I don't know what they must have thought about us when we're looking at us. They must have thought we were something out of a circus, you know. But, you know, the usual uh, Glasgow wee Bertie, you know, wee Glaswegian, given the wee chirpy bits, you know. And, uh, we man, have a look at that. What about him? You know, did we not see him in that move? You know, that kind of thing. You know, but we had all the we we sort of kind of took over. You know, the whole th the you know in the tunnel. It was a, a game of nerves, more or less. You know. And then all of a sudden, the only one thing that we did and we did well was on the bus. We could sing the Celtic songs, and that's what we did in the tunnel. And I'll tell you this much: that's when the game was won in the tunnel. And that Celtic song must be striking fear into the hearts of the Inter Milan supporters and their players. But these fellas are used to all the big games, but it's Celtic now coming forward on the first attack. And it's a beautiful pass. Down the right to Johnston. Now, what can the little trickster do? Well, you can certainly do it, and causing a bit of panic in that Inter defence. Inter, one of the best defences in the world, but it's... Now Celtic again, it's Jimmy Johnston trying to cut inside and a save by Sarti. Well, it's a bright opening by Celtic and here they come once again and they're taking the game to Inter which will shake the Italians, Jimmy Johnston. Super header and he's hit the ball or was it turned over by Sarti? And now Inter attack for the first time in the game. Now Capellini moving over to the right, and down he goes, he's brought down by Craig. It's a penalty. It's not a start you want in the European Cup final. I mean, we were a bit aggrieved at the time, but obviously when you see it replays, it was a penalty kick. Jim Craig won't forgive me for saying that, but <laughs> I think even he now admits that. Now, I'll tell you my favourite story of the time. Um, my father had been reluctant to come. Um, he didn't. He worked on a Saturday, Dad, so he didn't see many of the Saturday games, but always came during the week. And he'd been reluctant to come to Lisbon because he thought the Italians would be too strong for us. They were an experienced team and they'd shut up shop and they wouldn't manage to do it. And it was only on the Sunday before the game, that was four days beforehand, I finally persuaded him to come. I had a seat in a plane already for him and I had the ticket already for him as well. Um, I didn't see him before the game. Um, and then, of course, when I gave away the penalty kick, now, it sounds a strange thing to say because there was 55,000 people there and there were 22 players all upset about the penalty. I had a one... Uh, 11 were upset, another 10 were upset, <laughs> 11 were gloating. And my thought was, I can imagine what he's saying up there. I've brought him all this way. <laughs> I've virtually coerced him into coming. <laughs> and he's seen his son give away a penalty kick in the European Cup final. Yeah. And here comes the penalty. And Mazzola has scored. It's 1-0 for Inter after seven minutes. I'm playing a team like Milan and the Italian soccer at that time. Italian football, if you went 1-0 down, you needed the Panther division to break them down. But in, in saying that, we, were, we had played well up until then. We, we looked more like scoring than they did. Then when the penalty kick came around, we went 1-0 down. I think for about three or four minutes, I think in everybody's mind was, oh, gee, you know, it's going to be twice as hard. I've looked back on it often. I think the best thing that ever happened to us was them scoring. We felt it was an injustice at the time. We felt it wasn't a penalty kick and we felt it was wrongly given. And I think that helped us because from, from then on in, we knew there was only one way to win the game and it was taking it right to them, and that's what we did. The Celtic, one down, it's no use. Playing a defensive game now, they've got to come out and attack, and they're doing that so well. And the goalkeeper, Sarti, has had to play the game of his life. And Celtic once again coming forward. But again, this beautiful Inter Milan defence is so hard to crack it. But Celtic are trying hard enough, and they're trying to get down the right wing so much because Johnston 
has the beating of uh, Fichetti. Nice. McNeil winning the ball in midfield and once again down that right wing towards Johnston. And Johnston almost getting that one, but Fichetti beating him that time. And the referee, I think, has given a foul. Yes, a foul by Fichetti on Johnston. There's Stevie Chalmers wanting the player 10 yards back. Now to Johnston. And tremendous acceleration by Jimmy Johnston, but Peaky, the Sweeper comes across and it's out of play. Throw to Celtic. Johnston going to take it. Oh, it's a bad one. He should be receiving them, not taking them. And Celtic still in possession, still going forward. But that chip's too long, I think. Yes. I remember there was an old fella called Jimmy Gribbon and he used to say to us uh, before a game, he used to say, Bert, remember the ball round made to go round and the ball can travel much quicker than the man. So that's what we did. We never gave the ball away, we kept possession, and we got them turning. They were the ones that done all the running. Until such time we gave wee Jimmy the ball, that's when we got a rest. He must have been on the ball for about 87 minutes. Wee Jimmy was having one of those days when nobody could take the ball off him. The Italians were good markers, good defensive markers, but wee Jimmy just tore them apart that day. It didn't matter where he went to, he went outside left, outside right, up the middle, right back, midfielder. The guy was always there and you always seemed to, you never seemed to get rid of him. You maybe had to get past him once, maybe twice and he was, he was there and you never committed yourself. And if it looked as if you were, they would always check you, oh a foul, I'm sorry, you know, the great up to the referee, you know, a million apologies. Professional, very professional. They did what we thought they would do if they scored, they just fell back and tried to hold on to the ball. They gave us the ball as much as we liked. Uh, till about halfway into their own half, and then it closes down very, very quickly. Uh, but we uh, we had players capable of breaking down that, that type of formation, provided we kept the ball and used it sensibly. And we, Jimmy, obviously was one of them uh, responsible for breaking them down. He probably had the best marker in the world on top of him that day, this guy Bergnish. And uh, normally he would play in the right back position, but as soon as we kicked off, he went straight across and picked up Jimmy and marked him wherever Jimmy went. And Jimmy went for a wee wander now and again and dragged him out and left a bit of space down the right hand side for Bobby Lennox making, making runs out there and Jim Craig going forward. And the same thing was happening on the other side. And now Celtic coming forward again. It's Clark. Clark pushing it forward, and there's Gemmell. Tommy Gemmell, the attacking fullback. A little shuffle and the right foot shot, and that wasn't far wide. It turned out the easiest game that I had in the whole season because John Clark and myself really basically were never involved in the game to any great degree. They got a penalty kick earlier on um, and really never put any pressure on us. And my job that day was just picking up the ball and giving it to Bertie or giving it to to Bobby Murdoch and letting him go on with it. The movement that we got up front was tremendous because then it allowed us to get our full backs going forward. Jock Steen encouraged me uh, to go forward and as, as long as you went forward at the right times, mm -hmm. you had to remember first and foremost that you were a defender. Mm -hmm. But uh, I liked the attacking mm -hmm. uh, streak in yeah. me and uh, every opportunity I got forward. Now here's Gemmel once again, and a brilliant catch by Sati. What a good goalkeeper he is. I, I believe that the, 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 the heroes of that game were, were midfield and, and were defenders because they, they, they must have been knackered enough because they, <laughs> they were up and down, up and down all the time. Plus, it was in the, the heat, Jim, the heat was absolutely tremendous. That was another thing that was against us, that we conquered. I thought it was very, very hot. I thought the heat was... I thought it was tremendous that night. And it was one of the few games that I certainly had cramped my legs. Corner to Celtic, still a goal down, and a half chance there. But Celtic pressing forward all the time. They've got to do that, but they must be aware of the quick counter-attack. And here it comes, and out to his goal comes Simpson. Oh! We were caught so far up field, and there's this ball comes through, and quickly I came out and thought I could just hammer it up the park, but... 
I don't know who it was, one of their players closed me down quickly and I thought, I had it in my mind when I drew my foot back that if I hit it, it was going to hit him straight on and maybe go back over our heads towards goal and he would have lost me for pace going back the way, that's for sure. And I could see John Clark coming up the side and I sort of back here to John Clark. Brian is using from Brian out, trying to show his skills and he lets the ball go through him as if he's taking him back into the 18-yard line, you know. And all of a sudden, a bit of class about him, you know, he back heels it. But he knew I was there, he said, so he says, you know, but it came off for him. But I wonder what had happened if it didn't come off that day, you know. I thought then it was the correct thing to do. I might not do that again. Well, the minute's ticking away in the first half. Celtic still a goal down, but still probing away, throwing everything into attack. Oh, a lovely bit of footwork and a great shot, but just why? We had Stevie Chalmers, we had Bobby Lennox, we had Willie Wallace. Their running power was causing them all sorts of problems. But the interesting thing was that the, the, the one player, or the one person that we thought was a weak link in their team was the goalkeeper, Sarti. And he had the most magnificent game. Indeed, had it not been for Sarti, then we could have won by four or five. A great volley by Gemmell and a magnificent save again by Sarti. Here they come for the second half, and I wonder what Jock Steens told them during the interval. Basically, it was just go out there and do exactly what you've been doing in the first half. Only uh, get down into sort of wide positions earlier, and instead of firing balls into the box, try and cut them back a little bit further out towards the edge of the box, because what they did was they filled the, the, the whole of the goal area from the penalty spot in, Mm -hmm. uh, but with bodies, and it was very, very difficult uh, for front players uh, to get an opportunity to, to strike a goal. Wallace starts the second half. Celtic have Jock Steen's instructions fresh in their minds. The main thing uh, he impressed on the players was not to give the ball away uh, stupidly. He believed in uh, playing it wide, keep, keeping the defence wide, which was successful. Celtic still attacking, still going down the flanks, especially down the right one. Johnson inside this time. And he's brought down. It's a free kick, surely, yes, for Celtic. A nice curler. There's Billy McNeil up with the attack and into in a bit of disarray now. And that bicycle kick is surely dangerous play, surely an indirect free kick. It's Tommy Gemmell having a whack at it, but it is a free kick. Now Chalmers, a decoy run, Wallace to one side, and it's half cleared, but back it comes, and a great save by Sarti on the line, Chalmers thinks it's a goal. We were all sort of in the late 20s, early 30s, and we worked them so hard in that heat, that in about half an hour to go you could sense that they were starting to slow down a bit, they weren't as sharp as they were, they weren't as tight in the marking as they were in the first half when, they, uh, when we were trying to break them down. And we could sense this, and we still had so much of the ball, it was unbelievable. But you still got the impression that, uh, is this going to be one of these days, we're going to have so much of the ball, but we'll have nothing to show for it. We had four or five opportunities where the ball, you would have thought, by the law of averages, should have gone in, and it just didn't. And uh, I think I was beginning to watch the time at that particular point. Now, Murdoch, in possession, puts it wide to Craig, Craig take it inside, Gemmell's coming up fast on his left, there's the square ball and Gemmell has scored, he's equalised with that tremendous shot. After 62 minutes, Sarti no chance with that one and Craig has made up for that error in the first half when he gave away a penalty. But it's now one goal each and the odds are definitely on Celtic. Obviously Jim had got himself in a position, he received a great pass from Bobby Murdoch and uh, Bobby had made a run after the pass and he took his marker away. And uh, I mean, I was screaming to Jim Craig to, to cut it back, but he just timed it brilliantly. I thought for a second he wasn't going to cut it back at all, mm -hmm. uh, but he just timed it perfectly. The way our, our team pattern was, it was absolutely sacred that if Jim was forward, I was back. But uh, obviously we made exceptions that day. <laughs> if, for example, uh, that move had broken down and they had broken away, 
and scored a goal. Uh, I was the one that was in, uh, in trouble. I tell my boys that uh, it's just a question of standing there and very brazenly waiting for the perfect moment. But it wasn't quite as, <laughs> as meant as that, <laughs> you know. I got a fine pass on Murdoch. And um, again, you know, because you're playing at that level doesn't mean to say you cannot think your way across. As soon as I got it, I realised that I was in no position to shoot. There was one man between me and the goal. But I delayed because I wanted more men between me and the goal. And of course, as soon as more men came, that was the time to lay back the pass. And, that was something I had worked on beforehand. It was a very simple matter by watching films and things like that. I realised that um, if you held the ball long enough, the Italians would not want one man to one man. They would come and have another man behind that man, just in case, which then leaves a space somewhere else. It's quite simple to back. Well, after we equalised, we went back to the halfway line to restart the match, and Big Jock's sitting there on the bench, and he's giving me this, cool it, slow it down, and uh, we'll take them in extra time. And I said, for goodness sake, boss, I said, <laughs> we've equalised and there's about 20 minutes to go, so uh, there's no way I want to play another half hour. That's Gemmell, the scorer, coming forward once again for Celtic, one each. We had them on their heels at, at that time, so there was no point hanging back. It was well just taking the over the lines. Now Celtic really had them worried, and that one, though, a bit too high. But back comes Celtic, is out to Gemmell, and Milan really... In trouble now. Inter Milan looking as if they've had enough. Lovely cross. And Celtic have got so many players in the box. And a wonderful shot from Murdoch. And back come Celtic again. And a great save by Sarti. But still it's all Celtic now. Inter Milan really are struggling. And it's a beautiful shot. It inches over the bar. And Celtic once again. And the crossbar saves Inter. I watched the game with my son, and it's interesting to get somebody else's and a younger person's attitude, and he couldn't believe, he couldn't believe the ability in the side, he couldn't believe the skill. Because I think youngsters think that skill belongs to the modern day, and really he was quite astounded at, uh, at the ability, so. Celtic playing some beautiful football now, but it's still only one each. And Sarty in action once again, and the into defenders kicking it anywhere from defence, so unlike them. And back comes Celtic, and again it's Sarti to the rescue for Inter. Now Murdoch out to Gemmel on the left. Murdoch making ground. The little shimmy from Gemmel. Back to Murdoch. Chalmers, it's a goal! Celtic have in the lead with five minutes to go. And could that one be the winning goal? Certainly those fans think so. Played out of Big Tam, and then Big Tam went. He didn't commit himself. They were all back pedalling, mm -hmm. and uh, when got the time was right, when I I'd sort of supported it, and Tam pulled it back. I just wiped it across the face of the goal, and it was about six yards out. Steve's side foot, beautiful, beautiful contact. Steve just took it away. A lot of people still ask me, "Is yeah. that your goal?" And I said, "No chance." It was going for a shy. Yeah. There was nothing in there. Steve got a great contact and it stuck it away and that was it. People would think that was a bit of a fluke, that goal. I can assure you right now that we'd done the same thing in training day after day after day. Uh, full backs going down, cutting it back to midfield players and uh, the front players being in the goal area for tap-ins to go. And I, I mean, that was something we used in training every day of the week. In the case of my own goal, it could have been any one of a, the strikers, any one of the team putting that, that ball in the net because it was well and truly practised. Their heads would completely went down, and after that, uh, I mean, basically, we demoralised them. We just held on to the ball, knocked it around, gave it to me, Jimmy, gave it to Bertie, Bertie took it to the corner flag. Jimmy uh, just held the ball and he kept getting pulled down and uh, we kept getting free kicks and he'd give the ball back to Jimmy again and he'd hold on to it. Bertie would take the ball to the corner flag again. <coughs> I mean, uh, that completely demoralises you, especially when you think you're the kings of Europe and all of a sudden you know you're out, uh, you're beating the European Cup final. And there can't be long to go now. Celtic 2-1 in the lead. Have they got the European Cup in their grasp? They certainly have. The whistle's gone. And look at this mass invasion of the pitch. And this 
is a great moment for Scottish football. Celtic are the European champions. How well they deserve that title, because they played 62 games this season and won 51 of them. And how well they deserve this great ovation from all their fans. A tremendous performance by Celtic, the first British team to win that trophy. I think it was the following morning before we really realised what was happening. Indeed, it was probably, it didn't really sink in, probably until the following afternoon when we get back to Celtic Park and we got to Glasgow and all of a sudden it hit us then because I think we were living in cuckoo land up to then, you know. Coming through, I mean, the whole place was just full of people. It was absolutely tremendous coming back and coach right through Glasgow. That was probably the best part of the European Cup with the bit that it really sunk in. Come right through Glasgow and waving to all the people at the windows and people hanging out at the windows. And we turned into Celtic Park and there were 60,000 people there. That was, that, that's when you know you're the European champions. It was absolutely tremendous. We didn't just realise what we had achieved. We'd beat the best team in the world. The whole thing was just like, I mean, it was just like a, a, a bit of a dream. It was somewhere we never should have been there. It was great, and their fans thoroughly deserved it. It's an astonishing thing. You can lose, you can lose the appreciation of how much people uh, enjoyed that occasion, and it's only this year that it's come back to us because the impact we have made on on Celtic supporters was quite dramatic. 25 years to the day that Celtic became the first British club to lift the European Cup, a gala dinner is held in honour of the men who won. And that was a monumental evening, absolutely superb. I've spoken to hundreds of people who were at that dinner mm -hmm. and I haven't had one complaint yet. And in fact, some people carried on for another couple of days. I, I believe there's some like 900 there. And it was, it was absolutely excellent. We couldn't believe it, the reception that we got. I've grown men tying in my arms that many times. And um, we're all a bit emotional, you know. The hospitality time was difficult, terrific. We're a bit lucky, because um, I suppose any, any good team is entitled to be. We're lucky in the sense that the 24th happened to be a Sunday. So we were able to go from the 24th into the 25th, which is the Monday morning, and I can assure you it went on well into, not just the early hours, but some of the awakening hours of the, the 25th. But that was nice, and, and it was a terrific night, terrific night. to which that victory in Lisbon had touched the hearts of Celtic supporters. It's with great regret that 
Unfortunately, our mentor, Big Jock, is not here tonight. Having said that, wee Jimmy assures me he's behind that screen watching him. Memories flooding back that, uh, you know, you thought you'd forgotten or somebody joked in your memory or something like that, you know. Yeah, really astonishing. It's been a, an absolute privilege. It's out to Craig, squares it, here comes Gebel, he's equalised! We were great players and individuals and it was great to be involved with that, that crowd, on and off the park. Now Gebel! Murdoch, Chalmers, it's there! That big fellow up there, he's here, he, I mean, don't be kidding. Oh, the big man, God rest him, is away. But we don't believe, we believe that he's, he's watching everything. He's still here. Yeah, but we'll never ever let this go. We'll keep this going, because it was something special. The proudest moment for Billy McNeil and for Celtic, the first British club to win the European Cup. Who will ever forget May 1967 and the Lisbon Lions? All of uh, we Lisbon Lions would like nothing better than to see the club again get to the, the, the top of European football. We'd love that because it, to, it would take some pressure off us in an awful lot of ways because we've carried this, this accolade for an awful long time and while we've enjoyed it, we'd like nothing better than to see, and like nothing better than ourselves to go and watch Celtic playing. And, in European finals. That would delight every one of us. The Celtic will always be great. The fans will always ensure that because I doubt very much if any club anywhere in the world has got a better and more loyal group of fans.